Hello, this video is one of the modules on offer as part of the Foundation Online Training Course. Our unique course has helped over 10,000 people to study for their Foundation exam. And the course consists of online lessons, videos like this one, quizzes and mock tests. To access our free course and to get the latest version of this video and our collection of videos, go to www.hamtrain.co.uk. Now, on with the module. Hi, this is Kelly from Essex Ham and welcome to Foundation Online, getting you started with amateur radio. Here's what we'll be looking at in this module. Hello, my name is Pete and I'll be your guide for this module. Feeders and antennas. In this module, we'll look at the two types of feeder, four different types of antenna connectors, five common amateur radio antennas, gain and ERP, antenna matching and SWR. Feeder is used to connect the transmitter receiver to the antenna. Feeder exhibits a loss on transmit and receive. The longer the run of cable that you have between your radio and the antenna, the greater the amount of signal loss through the cable. Loss occurs as some of the radio energy is converted into heat. The feeder loss increases with the frequency. So for higher frequencies used at VHF and UHF, you'll need thicker low loss feeder to make sure more of your signal gets to the antenna. There are two types of feeder that we need to be concerned with at foundation. Coax, which is on the left, and twin feeder or ladder line which is on the right. Looking at coax first of all, this is the most widely used feeder that there is and it's unbalanced. More on this later in this module. The inner connector, which I'm circling here on the screen, is the part that carries the signal and the outer braid, again on the screen here, is the bit that keeps the signal inside the cable and also helps to stop electrical interference coming into that signal. On the right we have twin feeder. This is balanced, again more on this later. The two strands of the feeder here contain equal and opposite signals and they are separated evenly by plastic spacers. Now let's look at the four different types of connectors used by amateurs. Antennas and feeders are connected using various different types of connectors. The plugs and sockets that you use for RF radio frequencies should be of the correct type. The four we're about to talk about are all for use with coax and the screen of the coax must be correctly connected to ensure that RF signals don't get into or out from the cable. Let's look at the larger of the four connectors first. On the left we have the PL259. This is a screw thread locking connector. You can see the screw thread there with the center that contains the signal. This is commonly used for HF. This is a picture of a PL259 plug and the line drawing that you may see in the exam. On the right there is the N plug which is a screw thread locking plug as well. Slightly different you'll notice here. This is a picture of an N connector and the line drawing that you might see in the exam. Moving on to the smaller of the connectors, we have a BNC connector which is bayonet locking. A little bit like some of the old light bulbs where you have to push in and twist. Here is the bit where you twist and lock the connector into place. Be aware that there are two types of BNC connectors out there, 50 ohms and 75 ohms. We as amateurs use the 50 ohm version. This is a picture of a 50 ohm BNC and the line drawing that you might see in the exam. And finally for connectors, the SMA connector. Like two of the other ones we've previously looked at, this is a screw thread locking plug. Screw thread there. 
often found on handheld radios. Here's a picture and again the line drawing. Now let's move on to the various types of amateur radio antennas. What does an antenna do? It converts the electrical signals into radio waves and vice versa. Each antenna is designed for a specific frequency and there are different sizes of antenna for the various different frequencies and bands. In general, longer wavelengths, i.e. lower frequencies, will need a larger antenna. Pictured here are five amateur radio antennas. On the left we have the Yagi antenna, being held up by an amateur out on a radio field day. Next we have a dipole, this is the active part of a dipole. Here we have the 5 eighths wave antenna. Notice there's a small coil at the bottom of the antenna, that gives you the clue it's the 5 eighths. This is a quarter wave antenna quite often found on roofs of radio amateurs. And you can also just use a long piece of wire as an antenna. We'll cover these in a little more detail now. First off we're looking at the dipole antenna. On the screen here you can see a picture of a basic dipole. These are the two parts of the antenna that do the work. So a dipole is a balanced antenna. You can see two equal parts, meaning it's balanced. Ideally you'd want to feed this with a balanced feeder as well, which is the ladder line or twin feeder. So the basic dipole would be half of a wavelength long. So if we wanted to work on 14 megahertz, that would be the 20 meter band. And you can check that from the conversion table that's found in the exam that we've talked about in a previous module. So 14 megahertz would be 20 meters, half a wavelength long, so the entire antenna would be 10 meters long. Effectively, two halves being five meters. That's the basic balanced dipole antenna. Let's move on to something called the polar pattern, and here we're looking at a half wave dipole. In the red here on the screen, you can see the two elements of our balanced dipole. In green, there's a representation of what the signal is doing and how it's radiating out from our dipole. An antenna polar pattern shows how the radio signals radiate from the antenna. The maximum radiation you can see is at right angles to the active part of the dipole. We tend to use horizontally mounted dipoles for HF, with the aim being to get as much energy into the sky as we can. That was for a horizontally mounted dipole, let's look at a vertically mounted dipole. Again, here are the elements of our dipole. And you can see the signal is radiating out in this kind of pattern. If you were to look at it in 3D, it would look a little bit like a, a donut or a car inner tube, showing how the signal is radiated out from our balanced dipole. The radiated signal from the dipole is omnidirectional, meaning that the signal goes out in all directions. You may be asked in the exam to identify the polar pattern for a dipole, which is what you're seeing on the screen now. Next, the quarter wave ground plane antenna. This is a vertical antenna, you saw it earlier as the white stick I mentioned that you might find on top of an amateur's roof. These are a quarter of a wavelength long, as the name suggests. So for two meters, or one for four, you could expect this antenna to be 50 centimeters, or half a meter tall. You'll also note there are a number of wires coming off at the bottom here. These are called radials, and they form what's called a ground plane, which acts as a mirror to allow the radio signal to be sent off without any of the signal going below the antenna. Next, a very similar antenna, the 5 8 wave ground plane. Again, it's a vertical antenna. It's 5 8 of a wavelength long, as the name suggests. And these are slightly better at getting your signal to push out towards the horizon. You'll see the coil at the base is for coax matching, and we'll talk about matching a little later. Again, here are your 
radials acting as the ground plane. These are often used on VHF and UHF mobile and here you can see a picture of a 5 8 on top of a car with a magnetic mount. Effectively the car is acting as the ground plane to push the signal out and there is our matching coil. And next is the end fed antenna. This is basically a long piece of wire. It's unlikely to be the right length for the frequency that you'd like to operate on, so you need to match it to your transmitter. Again, more on this later. The long wires generally tend to cause more interference than any other type of antenna, and we'll talk about that in a later module when we discuss EMC. So that's the basic end fed long wire antenna. And finally, we're going to talk about the Yagi antenna. If you look on the roof of most properties, you'll notice a TV aerial. This is a Yagi antenna. Now these are directional, which means they focus the signal mainly in one direction. If you actually look closely, you'll see that this is a dipole. So there are the two elements of our dipole with a reflector at the back to help push the signal in the right direction and several directors in the direction of travel. So here's our coax being fed into the dipole, pushed into the direction of travel. On the screen now is the polar pattern for the Yagi antenna. Now pictured here are our two elements of the dipole. Imagine those placed here and you'll see what's going on. Here is the main lobe which is the direction that the signal is radiating in. That's where the signal's going. And the main lobe of the pattern shows where the signal is going. You'll also note some side lobes here on the left and right. Some signal does escape to the left and right, and some signal does escape behind the antenna as well. But you can see here quite clearly the antenna energy is being focused in the direction of travel on our Yagi. And if we were to look at the Yagi polar pattern in 3D, it would look something like this. Now we move into a tiny bit of maths where we're talking about gain and ERP. So an antenna is said to have a gain. The Yagi antenna, as I've just mentioned, focuses the energy in one direction and therefore has a higher gain than the other antennas we've talked about. Antennas have a measurement of gain in decibels or dB. This is relative to a half wave dipole. So you can have an antenna with a two times gain, so doubling the amount of gain. For example, if you were to feed five watts into the feed point here, 10 watts will go out in the direction of travel if our antenna has a times two gain. Times two is represented by three decibels. An antenna that has a four times gain will be said to have a six dB gain an antenna that has eight times the energy going out in the direction of travel would have a gain of 9 dB. And if 10 times the amount of energy was going out, that would be a 10 dB antenna. Fortunately, you get this table on the screen here in the exam. So you don't need to remember these, but you do need to be able to appreciate that you need to convert the times gain to the dB number. So let's look at this in practice, ERP. This stands for Effective Radiated Power. The directional power of an antenna is expressed as ERP, Effective Radiated Power. And it is the power 
applied to the antenna feed point, which is here where the coax connects to the antenna. So the power at this point multiplied by the antenna's gain in dB. We can express this as ERP in watts is the transmitted power multiplied by the gain. So a 10 watt feed from a transmitter into an antenna with a 3 dB gain effectively would give you 20 watts transmitted in the direction of travel. So to expand, if we feed a 3 dB Yagi with 10 watts, then 20 watts will be radiated in the primary direction. One of the common questions I'm asked is how can an antenna double the gain? Effectively, it's some plastic and metal. Well, technically it doesn't have an amplifier in, so it's not really amplifying in the true sense. The easiest way of thinking about this is to think about a torch bulb. So if you take the lid off a torch and turn on the torch, you'll find a light bulb that shines in all directions. To make the torch more useful, you put a reflector around the bulb, which focuses the light energy into one direction. It's not making the bulb any brighter, but all of the energy is being pushed in a single direction. Exactly the same with a beam antenna. You're focusing the antenna energy into one direction, so the observer's point would see more energy coming from that antenna. That was ERP. We now look at something called EIRP, which stands for Effective Isotropic Radiated Power. As we said on the last couple of slides, ERP is antenna gain relative to a half-wave dipole. Sometimes, however, you can find that gain is expressed in a different way, using EIRP. EIRP stands for Effective Isotropic Radiated Power, and it's a theoretical antenna that doesn't really exist other than in computer modelling. It's an antenna that radiates equally in all directions. You'll often find antenna manufacturers use this because it shows a better result than just plain old ERP. So why does EIRP matter at foundation? It matters for one exam question. Now the amateur radio license explains that powers over 10 watts EIRP require a special assessment. This is all about exposing members of the public to electromagnetic fields. The license states that if you're transmitting over 10 watts EIRP, then you are required to do an assessment. 10 watts EIRP is equivalent to 6.1 watts ERP. Annoyingly, this is a value that you may be asked at your exam. So for your exam, you're required to know that 10 watts EIRP is equivalent to 6.1 watts ERP. So in summary, EIRP is gain that's relative to a theoretical antenna, whereas ERP is gain relative to a half-wave dipole. You'll find more information on the EMF assessment and that 10 watts EIRP limit in Module 6, License Conditions. Moving on to polarisation. In amateur radio circles, you can either have an antenna horizontally polarised or vertically polarised. The antenna I'm showing you here, the 5 8 wave, is vertically polarised. The dipole antenna pictured here is horizontally polarised. The Yagi antenna, in the middle here, can either be vertically or horizontally polarised. Most VHF and UHF work is done vertically. At VHF and UHF, ideally you want both ends, the transmitter and the receiver, to have the same polarisation to catch as much of the energy that's being transmitted as possible. Polarisation is less of an issue at HF. HF relies on your signal being bounced off the ionosphere, as we'll discuss in the next module. Because your signal is being refracted from the ionosphere, it could come back at any polarisation, either vertically or horizontally, so it's less of an issue at HF. And the last part of this module is antenna matching and SWR. Pictured on the screen here is something called a ballon. 
Now we talked about balanced and unbalanced a little earlier. This should hopefully give it some clarification. So a balanced antenna would be our dipole antenna, which you can see on the screen here. Now typically you may be feeding this with coaxial cable, which is unbalanced. If you're feeding unbalanced coax into a balanced antenna, you need something to adjust the balance in the middle, which is called a ballon. This is balanced to unbalanced. So to connect a dipole using coax, you would need a ballon in place between the antenna and the coax. Let's look now at antenna feed points and impedance. The connection point from the feeder to the antenna is called the feed point. On the screen here you can see the antenna feed point, which is where the coax intersects with the antenna. An antenna, when it's set up in position, has an impedance, which is measured in ohms. The impedance of an antenna depends on its dimensions, its height, its width and its length. The impedance also varies depending on how the antenna is positioned and how high up from the ground it is, as well of course as the wavelength of the applied signal that you're transmitting. Antennas are designed for specific frequencies. The feed point impedance should be an ideal match for the feeder and the transmitter. As an example, coax feeder has an impedance of 50 ohms, and the transmitter is also looking for an impedance of 50 ohms. That means in ideal conditions, your antenna should also have an impedance of 50 ohms. Which takes us on to SWR, which stands for Standing Wave Ratio. If the impedance of the antenna is not a match for the feeder, some of the energy will be reflected back from the antenna down the feeder to the transmitter. This creates something called standing waves, and the worse the match, the more energy goes back to the transmitter. You use something called an SWR meter, standing wave ratio meter, to test whether the antenna is presenting a correct match. The picture you can see on the screen here is of a two needle SWR meter. The first needle will track the forward energy, the energy going into the antenna. The second needle will track how much of it gets reflected back. Both needles will move together when there's a signal through it. On the red you can see the SWR, so ideally you're looking for an SWR of 1 to 1, which means all of the energy is sent forward to the antenna and none of it is reflected back. Ideally a ratio of 1 to 1. If your SWR meter tells you that you've got a ratio of 1 to 1, you've got a good match between your transmitter, coax and antenna. And a reminder that if the SWR is too high, anything much over 2, that will indicate a mismatch between the antenna, the feeder and the transmitter, and that energy coming back to the transmitter could cause it damage. So how do you deal with a mismatch? If there is a mismatch between the transmitter and the antenna impedance, you could correct this using an AMU, an antenna matching unit. There's one pictured here, between the transmitter and our antenna. AMUs are more commonly referred to as ATU, the antenna tuning unit, but actually all it's doing is providing a match between the transmitter and the antenna. You have a choice. You can buy a manual AMU, like the one pictured here. You can see this one has the two needles built in and dials that you use to set the matching. Or you can use an automatic AMU. The AMU corrects the mismatch, reducing the SWR ratio to ensure that there's no damage to the transmitter. And the AMU, also known as the ATU, is commonly used when you're working multiband. Perhaps if you're out on a field day and you only have the one antenna, you might want to use multiple bands. To deal with the mismatch, you'd use your AMU. Here's a very quick demonstration of using an automatic AMU. Here's the AMU and the radio currently on a frequency of 7.048 megahertz on the 40 meter band.
and the AMU is currently showing a forward power of 12 watts, reflected of zero, which gives me a ratio of one to one. Let's say I now want to change to the 20 meter band. Let's look for a frequency of uh, 14242. Go over to the AMU, I press the tune button and it will automatically tune in. There we go, I still have forward of 12, reflected of zero and a good one to one match. And that's it for feeders and antennas. A quick recap, there are two types of feeder. There's the unbalanced coax and there's our ladder line balanced. The four different types of connector, PL259, N-type, BNC and SMA. The five antenna types, the dipole, which is balanced, the quarter wave and 5 8 the Yagi beam antenna and the end fed long wire. You need to use an AMU to match the antenna to the band that you want to work. Be aware of polarization, vertical or horizontal. And understand the concept of SWR, standing wave ratio. And remember, one to one is good. Anything over two to one could potentially be causing damage. Then there's ERP, effective radiated power, which is the transmitted power in watts multiplied by the antenna gain in decibels dB. And the ballon, to match a balanced antenna, like a dipole, to unbalanced coax feeder. Thanks for watching this latest module of our Foundation Online course. We hope you found it useful. If you're looking for some more help with your studies, we do recommend the Foundation Study Guide, available from Amazon in Kindle or paperback format. Thanks for watching again and best of luck with your studies. As a reminder, this video is part of the free Foundation Online course. If you're studying for Foundation, sign up and get access to all of the course material, including slides, lessons, handouts, videos, quizzes and our mocks. You can sign up at www.hamtrain.co.uk